good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action to the Child Protection Mainstreaming in Health webinar, Lessons Learned from the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, we are very much looking forward to our time together today. Uh, this is our sixth and final webinar in a series on COVID-19 adaptations in child protection programming. Um, the five other webinars are all available on the Alliance Facebook page and on the YouTube page. Um, so my name is Michelle Van Aken and I work with Plan International US and I will be your moderator during the webinar. Uh, with funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, PLAN is supporting the LD Working Group in developing capacity building resources for child protection actors to support adapting to COVID-19 realities. Uh, today, we'll be having a panel discussion, um, as I mentioned, looking at child protection mainstreaming and health activities. So to, to continue, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted now more than ever before the importance of mainstreaming child protection and health activities and in health facilities. Um, in many contexts, when lockdown started, child protection was not deemed an essential, um, an essential service, causing disruptions in protection mechanisms that have tangible effects on children and families. Mainstreaming child protection and health facilities is vital to ensuring children are protected in humanitarian crises, such as infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and the integration of child protection and health can also create a streamlined process for identification and referrals to additional services, linking more families to services and strengthening community protective measures. Um, we are so excited to introduce our panelists today all of whom have worked on at the child protection and health nexus, whether at the global or country level, and who will be sharing some of their experiences in mainstreaming child protection within health activities and health facilities during COVID-19. Um, so with us today, we have uh, Sabine Rakoto Malala, uh, technical advisor from the World Health Organization. Um, we have Dr. Ahmed Shakib Popal from uh, World Vision Afghanistan, the health sector lead. And we have Chrissy Hayes, who is the child protection subsector coordinator from UNICEF in Bangladesh. Um, a huge uh, welcome to our panelists and thank you so much for joining us today. I know that uh, schedules are busy and that contexts are challenging with you know, ongoing emergencies. So we appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and your learning. Um, following the panelist discussion, Katie Robertson, co-lead of the Learning and Development Working Group, will be sharing some new resources that have been developed with the funding from BHA on child protection, mainstreaming um, in health facilities and on maintaining family unity and preventing separation. Um, with that, um, I would like to proceed to our panel discussion. Um, and I'd like to start with a question for our um, country level practitioners. Um, so Chrissy and Ahmed, in your setting, how did the CP and health sectors work together um, in addressing COVID-19, uh, particularly in preventing family separation? Um, during COVID-19? And what did you find were best practices when working with families where caregivers contracted COVID-19? Um, Ahmed, if you could begin for us, thank you. Uh, thank you, Micheli, uh, for uh, the nice startup of this uh, webinar and all the preliminary information. I think from um, Afghanistan context where basically uh, we are working there. Uh, there are a lot of effort has been done in order to ensure that uh, child protection as, as well as also the health sector, they are uh, uh, working hand in hand together in order to ensure that the uh, benefit to all the humanitarian um, people as well as also the children basically uh, reaches on the best possible manner. Some of the things which basically we have done in order uh, during the time of the, the COVID-19 uh, was basically uh, promotion of the home quarantine. So this is also one of the main um, 
methods which we have done in order to ensure that the children are protected uh, safely and they are also uh, working within a safe uh, environment within the families. So uh, at the beginning, uh, because there were a lot of uh, um, uh, sort of threats uh, and a, a lot of basically afraid from the COVID-19, so easily the family members uh, put in an isolation ward inside of the hospital, whether their situation were a mild, moderate or severe. So there were not any ranking for that. So some of the people even got infected within the hospital up until their results, whether they are positive or negative comes out. So at, at that time, the situation were critical and the children were basically without their parents at home. So we tried with the Department of Public Health, World Health Organization and UNICEF colleagues, because we are all working in coordination with each other to ensure that uh, mild and moderate cases, we promote the home quarantine and only for the uh, severe one, we should also use the inpatient services. While this uh, family who they have the uh, positive case within the family, so we also not only promote it, but we also try to provide some support for them, such as provision of the hand sanitizer, mask, gloves and these all essential uh, personal protection equipment to the family as well as also to ensure that they are using the proper hand washing particularly uh, hand washing with soap with children for the children as well as also the people who are taking care of the covid positive uh, cases within the family what also we did, we did we try to ensure that the place which the children also living is a uh, free of germ and we try basically to do the household uh, hands, uh, household uh, disinfection of those positive cases as well as also uh, public places the houses which is living in the neighborhood of the positive cases in order to ensure that uh, the children also have the opportunity to play not to be locked within the uh, household so these are some of the things which basically um, has been done in addition also to ensure that uh, the children are also uh, 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 safe so uh, you know that in Afghanistan, we have the street living children or street working children phenomenon. So majority of these children, they also spend some of the time do the garbaging. So on that time of the COVID, because there are so many medical waste, which basically mix with the municipality waste. And we have seen everywhere in the city, masks, gloves and everything. So what we did also, we focus also on cleaning campaign for this, as well as also an installation of the modern uh, incinerator machine in order to collect all these medical weights of the COVID and ensure even the, the this uh, hospital waste does not mix with the municipality. So these are uh, some of the things which has been done to ensure that children are well protected during the time of the COVID and this has been done in very close coordination between the health uh, sector as well as also the protection. We also printed a lot of um, uh, IEC material and installed in the different location of the city and ensure that because you know that the COVID-19, the economic situation of the family members comes down and uh, basically uh, uh, children also they have to to work to earn money as well as also in uh, Afghanistan we have the issue of early marriage and also forced marriage so to prevent from children to basically misuse during the time of the COVID uh, several types of the IEC material printed and also disseminated virtual uh, a meeting virtual training also were conducted on that time, particularly with the community health shuras in order to ensure that the children are protected and safe and to solve the economic problem, there should not be any burden on the children. Over. Great. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for describing that. That's extremely interesting um, in terms of 
the learning there. Um, Chrissy, can you tell us about how the child protection and health sector work together um, in preventing family separation during COVID-19 and what were some of the best practices when working with families and caregivers? Sure. Firstly, just to put my response in context, I'll, I'll be talking primarily about the refugee camp setting, not the host community or the national context in general, which is slightly different. Um, in 2020 and 2021, the government of Bangladesh has implemented a range of measures in the camps to prevent and contain COVID-19. Um, this included severe access restrictions for humanitarian actors and in particular for protection, including child protection. Um, furthermore, these containment measures meant that only health staff were allowed in the COVID-19 hospitals, which we call Sari ITC centres here. Um, it was therefore imperative and essential that we really quickly worked closely with the health sector to ensure the protection of children in, in a range of contexts and in these challenging times. So the first step we took, which I think was the best practice, was together, both the child protection and health actors, to, sectors coordinators together with some, some of our um, sector members, developed a comprehensive guidance document, document, which was targeted at both child protection and health actors. The document outlined what to do in a range of foreseeable possibilities. So it was a scenario-based, it was a scenario-based um, document. So for example, what to do if a caregiver was tested positive and admitted to one of these COVID-19 hospitals without their child, or if they were admitted positive with their child. Similarly, if a child was admitted positive without their caregiver, or a child was admitted positive with their caregiver. So we outlined a range of all these different scenarios that were foreseeable in this context where we were, had very limited access to child protection. Um, when a caregiver was admitted without a child, children were usually contact persons. Therefore, they were required to stay for a period of time in quarantine centres. So they also set up quarantine centres around the camps. Um, child protection actors were allowed in these quarantine centres, but again, as I mentioned, we had very limited access to the camps at all. So from this document, we agreed that what was needed primarily first and foremost in these COVID-19 hospitals was at least one health actor, who they were the only ones allowed in there, who was had the skills to support and protect children. We decided to, together with the health sector, we decided to roll out several batches of trainings to the health staff on what we call child carers. And so the, the modules were um, basically on um, basic PSS, psychosocial support for children, um, psychosocial first aid, child-friendly communication. And then on a practical level, if they were admitted, if one was admitted without the other, whether it's child or caregiver admitted, separated from their caregiver, how to facilitate regular communication between the two. So this was done through, through the phones and with the support of the child protection um, volunteers or child protection actors in the camps, together with this child carer. So it was an example of really a collaboration between health and child protection. So health took on the responsibility of all the logistics, identifying the health staff for the trainings, while child protection facilitated the batches. And we reached over 130 health staff so that 24 seven, everyone at all the ITC centers, the, the hospitals, the COVID hospitals, had at least one child carer with these skills. So a frightened child who may be admitted without their caregiver at least had someone who was able to support them, to explain to them in a child-friendly manner what was going on, and also, also to facilitate some sort of communication with their caregiver or vice versa. Simultaneously, with regards to the quarantine centres, we took a different approach because child protection actors were allowed in there. However, we were limited access as humanitarian actors. Um, we previously had already tra trained up a lot of the child protection volunteers, so Rohingya volunteers in the camps as case managers. So each of the quarantine centres were assigned four child protection volunteers who were already trained in, in case management but were given an additional two day training on how to support children who were admitted into the quarantine centers with or without their caregivers. Um, so the, these, these volunteers who were um, supported by caseworkers in Cox's Bazaar remotely 
um, visited the children at least once a day, but usually spend most of the day with the children doing recreational activities, explaining to them what's going on, explaining to them this is temporary. Um, and again, where they were admitted without their caregivers, facilitating the communication with their caregivers. So these, this document acted as a foundation to ensure that all the scenarios were covered and that children not only received some support um, and weren't so frightened because we realized that psychosocial distress was, was one of the key and first, first kind of concerns that was gonna come out of this, but also that they maintained at least contact with their caregivers if they were separated. So this was a foundation and it was really a joint effort between health and child protection. It was not done by one or the other. It was really a joint effort. So I, I see that as the best practice. Um, yes, so I think I'll stop there. Um, obviously the document outlined all the screening steps and for reunification in line with existing protocols. So it's quite a little bit of a complicated document, um, but um, I think it, it laid the foundation for future collaboration, which has been ongoing ever since. Thank you, Chrissy. That's, I mean, that's an amazing example of child protection and health actors really collaborating. Um, I thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's, it's exciting to see how successfully um, the CP and health sectors worked together to make sure that health staff were trained up and that, you know, the, the um, COVID treatment centers had staff who knew how to work with children. Um, I think that's a really encouraging example. Um, with that, I'd like to actually ask Sabine um, about now that we have seen how colleagues at field level had to adjust to COVID-19 and work together across child protection and health sectors. Um, I'd also be interested in hearing from you, Sabine, like how was feedback and learning from the field incorporated into guidance and response from the World Health Organization? Thanks, Michelle, for such a great question. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm sure you've all experienced this too, but when COVID happened, uh, one of my daughters started having anxiety attacks for the first time in her life at the age of 11. And then my three children were so concerned about their, their peers at school. They said, but this child already has problems at school. How are they gonna manage? And, um, and this child actually, I think isn't, the parents aren't good to her and she's gonna be suffering even more. So I think from a children's perspective, it was really interesting to see how the COVID pandemic affected them and how they suddenly realized that this mental health and physical health was so important for children themselves. So somewhere there was a bit of an opportunity here in this terrible COVID time um, for children to understand and for parents to understand and for practitioners to understand how important it was to protect the children. But um, what did WHO do? Um, as you said, Michelle, I wasn't at country level, I'm at HQ level. And uh, we did do um, a couple of things. Of course, the first thing is that we started assessing the risks. Uh, we realized like with other pandemics, the Ebola or um, uh, pandemic, for example, that uh, there would be reduced social support for children. There would be an increase in alcohol and substance abuse. Uh, psychological disorders, anxiety attacks being one of them, but of course, depression, loneliness, um, um, all types of psychological disorders with children and parents. Um, an increase in uh, violent parental conflict. We saw huge increases immediately of domestic abuse, which we've seen in places, uh, even for example, after the Haiti earthquake or, um, or for example, in situations of Ebola, when there's more stress, there's more conflict in the household stress due to economic uncertainty and limited chances to seek help, and then weaker economic safety nets. So of course, these risk factors, we kind of all know them, but we're in, a, in the middle of a pandemic, um, we are reminded of how important these risk factors are. Then we really did uh, two things. We started assessing the data points where this was happening, um, where, where the issues were increasing. It was very difficult. It was of course, in the middle of a pandemic, you can't ask WHO country office to please start assessing how violence against children is increasing because they're in the middle of mask delivery, setting up regulations, vaccinations, and so on. Um, but through media reports, we were seeing huge increases in uh, helplines. In China, for example, there was, uh, within the first two months, there was a triple increase in the, in the cases of domestic violence. In the EU was reporting an increase of, uh, of 
of phone number uh, uh, phone calls being received by uh, aid organizations across the, across the whole of Europe um, the US as well and and really all countries we were seeing an increase in in calls and in uh, reports of domestic abuse and child abuse um, then we started collecting uh, examples of what countries were doing uh, in terms of prevention and response. So we had countries like Austria that were providing places for refugee women to be able to remove them from a violent family. Uh, Australia very quickly put up a fund, I think it was $150 million to support Australians experiencing domestic violence. In India, they set up a special helpline for uh, victims of domestic violence. And I in France, they, they set up a, a, a system where you could go to the pharmacy and text uh, and say a word, and that meant that they were that, that the person was suffering from domestic violence and that, that could access support. So it was almost a secret code. Um, so we were collecting the prevalence data and we were collecting examples of prevention and response services. And then, of course, like everyone, we issued the guidance. And the, the guidance really was focused on five things. The first one was ensuring that child protection services are remain essential and budgeted. The second one is that um, uh, health and mental health services continue to operate. The third recommendation is that case management um, uh, continue to operate, uh, including alternative care arrangements. The fourth one was ensuring um, uh, social protection for the most vulnerable children. And then the fifth recommendation was ensuring that we can engage parents and or support parents and caregivers to look after their children. So those were really the five recommendations that came out of the, what we were seeing in terms of what was happening at country level. Back to you. Great, thank you. Um, I just have a quick follow-up question for you, if that's all right. Um, so a lot of the examples you cited are from much more developed contexts. You've mentioned Austria, Australia, um, France, and I'm just interested to see how would you, how did you take best learning from, from these much, you know, more developed um, economies and countries, and then think about how to then apply that to a more of a developing context or a humanitarian context? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, two things. One, I, um, I often try to dissociate the humanitarian and, and developing context because I think the recommendations that I mentioned, you know, maintaining child protection services, it was happening in Switzerland. It could, um, I, I understand from Chrissy that it couldn't happen in Cox Bazar, but um, how much, and you know, was it, it was clearly possible in Afghanistan. I think uh, Dr. Ahmed was saying that it was possible. So I think we can um, maintain some of these things, for example, the, the social welfare services. Um, and then um, uh, in terms of disseminating the information, of course, we were doing like everyone, just trying to uh, set up the recommendations through webinars and share them as much as possible. And, and I really think that countries like Central African Republic or with Bangladesh or Colombia or Honduras, uh, if they're struggling with these issues, they should um, see what other uh, developed countries are doing um, and, and learn from those countries as well as the other way around. Because of course, many of the richer countries were learning what, from what would happen in the Haiti earthquake or in the Ebola situation where they were also in situations of confinement. So there was a lot of cross learning in these moments. Great, thank you. And sorry for throwing you a curveball. I just found that very interesting. Um, you know, now having had a bit more of like the global level perspective, I think it'd be interesting to hear from Ahmed and, and Chrissy again. Um, so mainstreaming child protection and health facilities involves a great deal of communication and coordination. Um, this is especially true when it comes to identification and referral of child maltreatments. Um, Chrissy and Ahmed, I would love to hear about how child protection and health practitioners worked to streamline communication and coordination in the case of identification and referral of child maltreatment in a health setting during COVID-19. Um, Chrissy, I would love to hear from you first on this question. Sure, I'm happy to go first. So for mainstreaming in the Cox's Bazaar context, we took a little bit of a different approach. Um, we recognised that the health sector was already overwhelmed and overburdened with not only with COVID-19, but we had cholera outbreaks and all of these, all the, a lot of other issues. So we realised they were being overburdened. Not only that, but they were being approached by GBV, by protection, by gender, by disability, by child protection, by basically every cross-cutting theme demanding that, that that be considered. 
So what we did was we came under the umbrella of the protection sector. We worked particularly um, GBV, child protection and, the, and general protection under the umbrella of the protection sector. We decided that to streamline this support and streamline this mainstreaming um, actions to, to, um, for, for the health sector. So what we did was we identified from, from our partners, we identified one protection mainstreaming focal point who was embedded within the health sector. So that meant they attended all of the meetings, they reviewed all the documents, SOPs, planning, um, project documents for the, for the joint response plan, et cetera. And attached to that protection mainstreaming focal point were three resource people from child protection. So myself being one of them and two and two other resource people for, for this um, to, uh, mainstreaming focal point. So whenever this mainstreaming focal point had a question about child protection, they would reach out for us. But not only that, we got the opportunity whenever one of the health sector documents was being circulated for review, we would input our child protection aspect within those documents. Another, another part of this mainstreaming, streamlining the mainstreaming was providing training to the health staff. So the protection mainstreaming focal point together with the resource people from GBV and child protection have started training the health sector staff. So for example, this week we did um, we did a full day training for the senior level staff. So for supervisors and managers on um, general protection, GPV and child protection um, with a little bit of disability roles in there. Um, and then there's over the next few weeks, we'll be training clinical supervisors similarly on mainstreaming child protection. Um, along with protection and gender-based violence. And this was really well received by the um, health sector because it meant they weren't being approached from all different angles, but all different um, cross-cutting themes, I guess, um, wanting to be mainstreamed. But instead they had one focal point who would support them and they were really willing to be supported to ensure that children were protected. Um, and it was really well received, the training we did yesterday, We've developed um, several tip sheets of which we were able to include a lot, a lot of child protection activities, um, um, actions that can be taken by various levels from right down to the community health volunteers up to those um, senior management staff. So those tip sheets really, um, they're quite extensive. They're called tip sheets, but they're actually quite extensive, but there's significant components of, of how they can mainstream child protection at various levels. So our approach in Cox's Bazaar was really to streamline it and make it easier for the health sector. And they were really receptive to that because um, it made it much easier for them to continue their work, but make sure that everyone is protected, um, which obviously is in everyone's best interest. Um, Chrissy, if it's okay, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question. Um, Please do you, go ahead. It sounds like these um, adaptations, like the, the streamlining has really worked well. Do you think that this is learning that will continue even post-COVID, should we ever get to post-COVID? <laughs> And do you think it could be applicable for other sectors as well and how they coordinate? Definitely. And we're actually looking at how we can embed a mainstreaming focal point in other sectors already. We're already starting to investigate that. Um, so the food security and livelihood sector is, is already has someone nominated to embed, um, will embed a protection mainstreaming focal point and we'll have the same three resource people attached to that mainstreaming focal point in the food security and livelihoods. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to do that across all of the sectors. Um, obviously health was the priority because they have the most access to the camps and the most access to vulnerable populations, including children. Um, but definitely I think it was the best practice. And, and I, think, um, I think we all know how other sectors feel, the fatigue of being bombarded by all the different cross-cutting themes that demand that th their gender is on the top of the list or disability is on the top of the list. And, and this really made it much easier that they can actually, also we've seen them proactively reaching out for support, which has been really good. So when the, you know they wanted to know what to do um, when, when there was abandoned babies at, at some of the health clinics. So they reach out directly to us. The mainstream focal point didn't have the answer. So instead they, they handball that to 
to myself and the other two resource people to provide advice to the health sector on how to how to handle those sorts of situations. So the health sector has really embraced it. And I think it's something that, yeah, definitely we'd, we'd hope to continue post COVID if we ever get there, um, but even as the best practice across humanitarian settings. Thank you so much, Chrissy. I think that's you know really interesting learning. I know that streamlining that communication is always so important um, and also means that that you know those messages are better heard and listened to when it's not coming from a million different angles. Um, speaking of post-COVID, I think it's also important to acknowledge that while COVID is top of mind for much of the world, it's not the only challenge and it's not the only um, it's not the only you know, threat that we're currently facing. Um, so Ahmed, um, I would like to ask you, recognizing that COVID-19 may not be the most significant challenge Afghanistan is currently facing, um, how has the um, ongoing conflict and the other emerging crises further impacted health and child protection, particularly as regards COVID-19 during this fourth wave that um, Afghanistan is experiencing? Uh, thank you, Kirisi, for all the detailed information and Micheline for uh, this uh, question. Uh, basically, uh, when talking about the Afghanistan, basically every year we are experiencing different types of the emergencies in Afghanistan. Uh, since 2018, we have experienced the large drought in majority of the provinces of Afghanistan. And that also followed by the COVID-19. And then we had also the different uh, conflict going on everywhere in Afghanistan. And recently we have also the collapse of the health system and changing the government in Afghanistan. So all these basically factors uh, contributed to worsening of the situation. Uh, right now, uh, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, based on the collapse of the funding from donor who supported the health system in Afghanistan, 90% um, of uh, health facilities across all the country uh, basically collapsed uh, since uh, uh, 5th of uh, September 2021. Uh, it means that uh, the health system which we had before, right now we do not even have that system in place. And uh, uh, the prevalence of the disease also has been increasing day by day. Um, the, the number of the, the children who are suffering from the aerial disease, ARI, is increasing day by day. And sometimes we look at the health facility data, we can see that even children 60 to 80 percent suffering from the diarrheal disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the level of access of the population to the health services right now, it has been become limited and limited. In the other side, uh, we can see that the malnutrition also was a big challenge for Afghanistan within these 20 years. But it was uh, basically on the less than 10% were the global acute malnutrition rate. Due to the COVID, it's basically escalated. But recently, the nutrition cluster data shows that uh, almost one out of two under five children in Afghanistan, they are suffering from malnutrition and something around uh, 700,000 of pregnant and lactating women are suffering from malnutrition. So we know that malnutrition contribute to disease. Disease can contribute to malnutrition. And we can see that the situation is become uh, worse. We have also a in our head a possibility of the fourth wave of the COVID-19 in Afghanistan. We have passed the, the three wave or three phases or rounds of the COVID in Afghanistan. So the morbidity and mortality were high. Even in the past where we had the health system, there was shortage of the basic and vital equipment such as incubator. Uh, many cases basically lost their life due to the lack of oxygen and also 
other related material which is needed on that stage. But uh, right now, the situation has been completely changed. The fourth round, uh, it is expected or it is predicated that should be four times maybe the case load, maybe more. And the resources which we have will be almost zero because we had three COVID hospital and right now all has been collapsed. So these are some of the potential factor which basically can contribute to the worsening of the situation. And basically we need to focus more on, on this in a country where the health system completely broken and there is not also the proper support for children, for women, as well as all for the entire of the population. So we expect that uh, so many lives will be in danger and definitely Afghanistan need uh, more international support. And the health and child protection basically needed to be more and more work together in order to ensure that also children protected on uh, this difficult situation. What World Vision has done in the past through the health center, which we are working, we are also conducting the capacity building training for the healthcare provider on child protection, uh, as well as also we are doing the mental health and psychosocial support. So we do not only provide primary healthcare services, but we are also ensure that uh, the mobile health team staff, such as doctors, midwife, nurses, vaccinators, they are fully equipped with the knowledge when they see uh, cases of the child protection, how to stop, how to basically provide services and how to report. So we have the health sector within World Vision and also we have the protection sector as well. This uh, protection sector, we have the child protection referral case officer. So all the doctor, midwife, nurses, which they are see any cases, they uh, immediately report to the uh, child protection case officer. And then the person basically put the name in the database. And for the every case, there are a system and follow up how the World Vision is able to provide the utmost support to the case. And once the case become clear and the problem is solved, then the case will be closed and reported as a close. Otherwise, it will be open. And then everyone within the organization try to see basically how we are also provide the more support for them. This also in the community level, in order to identify whether the, there is not any issue within the household where the, it is not possible for World Vision staff to basically do the proper household visit of entire of the community. We are also relying on the community structure. We have the family health action groups. These are the group of 10 to, uh, to 15 women per each uh, location. And then we also train them on all main uh, child protection issues. And then if they are uh, identify any things within the household, need to basically report to the midwife or the doctor which is available in the field and then those will report to the child protection referral case officer. With these things, they have done a great job and they have stopped many cases of the early marriage. We have built their capacity on the child rights and also all this child protection issue, how they can affect the emotional and also spiritual development of the brain of the children when they affect with any of this issue. So they become aware about it and also they definitely in the area which they are working, they are trying to basically stop such a, these things. And uh, there are complex contexts right now in Afghanistan, multi-dimension emergency and the situation, I think it's right now, it's a, like a crisis situation and the children in Afghanistan, they are experiencing very tough situation for their uh, health status as well as also they are facing with many issues related to the child protection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. That's a rich amount of information. Um, I'd like to address the last question to Sabine. You know, talking about, you know, especially on this theme of, you know, of challenges that in addition to COVID-19, um, but in a slightly different vein, what are some aspects of the impact of COVID-19 that we have not necessarily delved into yet or that we're just you know, finding 
more information and evidence regarding um, that the World Health Organization has responded to in collaboration with its partners. Thank you, um, Michelle. It's a really good question. And in fact, we've just finished a review and I'm just going to share the slide. I really think these are very useful slides to show. We um, have just finished this review with the CDC and University of Oxford and World Bank, which shows some quite impressive figures. So here you see the, the increase in 2020 and 2021 of COVID deaths and then the number of orphans along with that. This is completely hot off the press information. Um, and it's shocking. So you see, of course, a huge increase in 2021 of COVID and 3.6 million deaths and 1.8 million uh, affected children. So for every two COVID deaths, you have one child that will be facing orphanhood. Um, and so really, uh, Ahmed, I know that in, in Afghanistan, you have this strong uh, family system where uh, children are, are taken into families. But we do know that even in the most poor families, it's difficult for them to look after an additional child. And these are the recommendations that this group of actors, which includes the CDC and WHO and World Bank and uh, USAID and so on, are making are really three pillars of work. First of all, one around prevention of uh, further deaths, of course, around uh, equitable vaccine and strengthening health systems. That's the first pillar of work, preventing deaths of caregivers. The second pillar is uh, family-based services to avoid institutionalization, which happens in many countries still. So um, safe and supportive family-based care and case management. Um, and then the third one is protecting children from adversity with a cash plus care model so that they get parenting support in addition to um, cash support. So really quite simple if you think of it. I mean, preventing the COVID deaths, supporting uh, family-based care and supporting parents and caregivers, and then supporting uh, the third pillar of work, supporting children that are families that are suffering most with cash and care models. And then of course, across the board, you see here at the bottom, the more um, traditional uh, work that needs to continue to happen. So social work services, uh, funding and, and uh, support provided by uh, the private sector, NGOs, faith-based organizations, quality accessible childcare, accessible education, as long as the kids stay in school, at least they have a sense of feeling protected. Um, accessible public health care, and then safety nets uh, for children and families to respond to shock. So this is a very dense slide with a lot of information, but I find it summarizes it really well, especially for this increase in orphans in the world today. Thank you so much, Sabine. I think this is really, you know, fascinating, but also fascinating in a worrying way information. And an area that we perhaps have not touched on as much as a humanitarian community. Um, and so I think this will be an interesting area to continue exploring and to continue thinking about how do we address this challenge. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists um, bef and thank you for answering our questions and sharing your experiences. Um, we're now going to have Katie Robertson, co-lead of the Learning and Development Working Group, briefly share the new um, child protection and health um, resources that have been developed by her and her team. Thanks so much, Michelle. And thank you to everybody on the panel for a really interesting discussion. Um, yes, I'm very happy just to let you know that we have developed some new resources on this topic. So we've developed two learning modules. The first is child protection mainstreaming in health facilities and is designed for CPHA practitioners to deliver to health partners um, to try and improve coordination between the sectors in the context of COVID and other similar infectious disease outbreaks. Um, so the module is written with instructions for both face-to-face -face training and remotely facilitated training. So you've got two options depending on, on the situation in your context. Um, and it is available in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and there's also a tip sheet that accompanies this module with, with the key messages that can be used as a handout or just used on its own. And then the second module is preventing family separation and preserving family unity during COVID-19. So this one is designed for child protection staff who are directly implementing programs. Um, so it could be assistant officer or manager level. Again, it's, it's written for both face-to-face -face delivery and remote delivery, it's a little bit longer, one and a half days face to face. Um, and again, is accompanied by a tip sheet with all of the key messages in and is available in all four languages. 
So these are just two of nine learning modules. Um, so if you want to hear more about those and you're registered for the annual meeting, then do come along to, to our sessions and we will tell you all about them. Um, and do keep an eye out for the microsite as well. Thanks, Michelle. Great. Um, thank you, Katie. We're very excited about these resources. Um, and so I'd like to conclude our time together. We're actually on time for once, which is a rare occurrence for our webinars. But so as we're ending this time together, I would very much like to extend um, a very, very heartfelt thanks to all of you for attending across so many different contexts and different places in the world. Um, to our panelists for joining us um, across many different time zones and um, joining us from contexts where there are so many ongoing challenges and crises and just where I know teams are working full out to respond not just to COVID-19, but as well as to other ongoing um, challenges. So thank you for taking that time to share your learnings and your experience. Um, and of course, I would like to thank the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, um, as well as our, our donor, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Um, this concludes our six part webinar series. As I mentioned, the first um, five webinars are all up on the Facebook page. Um, the first four webinars are available on the Alliance YouTube page on the Learning and Development Working Group channel. Um, they are available in English and as well as with subtitles in French, Arabic, and Spanish. Um, the final two webinars will also shortly be up on the Alliance, on the Alliance YouTube page as well. Um, thank you to all who have joined and participated along the way and have supported the development of these resources. Um, we will be sharing the link to the microsite um, with all of the attendees, to all the attendees of this uh, webinar. And um, Elena, as Elena has mentioned in the chat, please feel free to write to the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance if you'd like some more information on these resources. Um, so with a very heart heartfelt thanks, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.